take your Bible again. This time we're looking at Ephesians. It's on page 976 in the Pew Bible. And there's a white sheet that has the notes, if you find them helpful. In God's family, Ephesians 2, 11 through 13, the, no, the notes there, the problem of being an outsider, born outside of the people of God, without hope, without God, and folded into the family by the blood of Christ. Let's give our attention again to the reading of God's word. I will read uh, verses 11 through 13. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision, by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. This is God's word for us. Let's pray again. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you would open our hearts to your word, that by your spirit you would make the reading and especially the preaching of the word an effective means to convict us of sin, to comfort us and to call us in faith in Christ. Amen. So what do you want to hear first, the good news or the bad news? A lot of people like to get the bad news over and done with first. Uh, but sometimes if there's anything good to focus on, you should start with that. A number of years ago, I had a serious issue with my car, and the mechanic called me, and he said, well, do you want the good news or the bad news? I said, please tell me the good news first. And there was a pause. There is no good news. <laughs> Your engine is fried. Uh, when I ask you, do you want to hear the good news or the bad news, be assured there is good news. But St. Paul here is starting with the bad news again, just like he did at the very beginning of chapter 2. The beginning of chapter 2 says we're dead in trespasses and sins. You were dead in trespasses and sins. You know, among all have been under this. This is as bad as it can possibly be. Now, people who are dead in trespasses and sins can still do a lot of good things. It's not that they're always planning up how to trip people. and No, they do good things, but they're separate from God because of their sin. Dead in trespasses and sin. And the sin that they have even mars the good things that they would do. Because that's what sin does. It rots things. It destroys things. It hurts things. But... You remember, there's good news that goes along with this. We who are spiritually dead are being made alive in Christ, through Christ, empowered by the Savior, Jesus Christ. And not only that, God has made us to be able to do things that are really good. We are his workmanship. He's prepared us to do good works. He's even laid them out for us. So that these good works we do are really good, and they're really God's work in us. That is my testimony. That's joyful. I hope that's your testimony, too. But there's more bad news in verse 11. Different type of bad news. You know, spiritual death affects everyone. But this is the bad news that doesn't apply necessarily to everyone. But as I look at it, it certainly applies to me. And it applies probably to most of you as well. The solution to our spiritual death is being in Christ, knowing the gospel, being made new. The second problem is this. The way you find that out is by God's word and through the plan of God and the people of God and uh, 
as I was born away from that, in a sense, I've got no business expecting that this would be good news for me, that I would even hear this. The prophets of the Old Testament talked about the Messiah that would come. Messiah, Christ, same word, different languages. But it was the Jewish Messiah because Jesus was Jewish. Jesus still is Jewish. Jesus was the one that was promised. So how is it that I would even know about this Savior that would come, promised to these people by their prophets, and I'm outside and away? Have you ever been an outsider? I bet you have. I don't care who you are. You walk into a certain situation, you, you feel like an outsider. They talk in language. I don't know what they're talking about. I'd like to join in, but no. Sometimes I did kind of know what they were talking about, but they had no interest in talking to me. Uh, it's like it's a foreign language, or I was, I, I like there was a barrier, and it's not comfortable. Now, this can be a problem if it's something you really need to be a part of, but here, it's not just some great thing that's happening. We're being told that we were outsiders to the very thing that we need for life. Um, and it can be very close. It can be close and you just don't see it. Many years ago when my daughter was in Winston-Salem, she was North Carolina School of the Arts and she did opera. So I got into opera and I, opera is wild. It is everything in performing arts is there visually, et cetera. And Stevenson Center is downtown Winston-Salem and I've attended uh, a number of fantastic performances there the, the set, the curtain opens and the people applaud the sets because they're beautiful. Uh, that's the way it was. And then the costumes are that way. And the orchestra plays, they play all the best bits of the opera, all the great tunes. And it's just wonderful in itself. It's a concert. And then they begin to sing. And the acting and going on and, uh, okay, someone dies. Uh, that's an opera, right? Uh, the opera's not over until somebody dies, usually. But it's all very dramatic, and it, it, it puts this across. But there is a time sometimes when there is a solo, and the instruments fall silent, and the other musicians, the singers, fall silent. And there's just this tenor standing there singing. His voice fills the room. And we all sort of lean in, almost holding our breath. It is, it's... It's sublime. There's something really beautiful about that. Now, here's the, it's not that I just love opera that I tell you about this, but you see something that is so amazing, and yet just outside the wall, there are people driving by. They have no idea this is happening. They could, they could be part of this. It could be something else, but there's something they're not a part of. They don't even know it's there. They're honking at someone because they're taking their parking spot, and there's somebody who's worried about, you know, i got to get something from the store, all of these things. You know, 600 people in that room, they know. The audience knows. The musician knows. Everybody else, they may be having a good day, a bad day. They have no idea of what's going on inside. Now, that's maybe not a real significant example because it's a sublime moment. It's something to experience. And you could, if you're not into opera, you can put in your own experience there. Here, Paul is talking about that which we need to live. And there are people who are just outside and don't know it. Even now, as the gospel is preached on the airwaves, they don't know, they don't hear that it's for them. I was no part of those born on the all outside. Paul writes this to me. Verse 11 again. Therefore, remember, at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what's called the circumcision, which is made with flesh by hands, you know, you were, you were outsiders, is what he's saying, and it's no small thing. Because the people of God, Israel, was given very special things. They were given the covenant of God. They were given the law of God. They were protected by God. They had all of the promises of God, and the Lord sent our Lord Jesus Christ, to his covenant people who heard the gospel. And as Paul says in Romans, it is to the Jews first and also to the rest of us. This is who we are. 
It's a privileged place. By the way, people talk about privilege like it's not a good thing. Privilege is a good thing. Isn't it? What's a perk, a privilege of rank? We have what God has given us. Well, you didn't earn that privilege. That's irrelevant. The privilege is the privilege. And those who were part of that were privileged. And so in the Bible, in the Old Testament, there is sort of a division between God's covenant people and everybody else. So there's God's nation and the nations, the, the, the goyim, the, the, the ethnos, the, the others. And this is the way the Jewish people were, in one sense, taught, and they were also uh, thought. You know, if, if, who's, who's Paul writing to here? Well, he's writing to the, to the goyim. He's writing to the Gentiles. He's writing to us. He's writing, now, if you're Jewish, then you've got that other, too. But he also will talk about you're not saved by your connection to Moses. You're saved through Christ like the rest of us. Verse 11 again, remember, at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what's called the circumcision made by hands. Uh, that means outside of the covenant. The covenant sign that the people of Israel had was circumcision given to each of the male uh, members, each of the boys. Uh, they belonged to God. It's a reminder that they belonged to God. And we have a covenant symbol as well. It's given to boys and girls, men and women, and it's baptism. And you realize that when you have been uh, baptized, you're being baptized really by Christ. And you're being received into Christ. Martin Luther used to say, you know, well, as a baptized person, I should not be doing this, or I should be doing that. What does he mean? I belong to Jesus. You should think about your baptism. Why? Because that means you belong. You belong. It's the... It's the covenantal sign that you belong to Christ. You're not saved by your baptism, but it's the sign of your salvation. Well, here's the kicker. Uh, the, the words of exclusion, those who had that sign, the circumcision, talked about the rest as uncircumcised, as, as other. They kind of have a point. That's, that's the hard part. We were on the outside. We are on the outside until we're brought in in Christ. Verse 12, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. And that's true of them and true of me while I was separated from Christ. Just a quick review. We're in the baseball season. Strike one, you're dead in your trespasses and sins. And by the way, dead is, that's dead. I mean, not, that's really bad. Two, and you're outside of the solution. Either one of those are a big, big, big problem. But before I get too far in this, I want to remember there is good news. And the good news is that in the gospel of Jesus Christ, it specifically goes out, not just to the Jews, not just to those in Jerusalem, but it goes out to every nation, every tongue, every group. It is for all to hear. By the way, this is for you. What did Peter say on the day of Pentecost? He said, uh, they said to him, you, know, you, you, you crucified Jesus. And they said, what shall we do? He says, well, repent. You know, believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be baptized. This is for you and for your children. Oh, that's the old covenantal language. For me and for my children. And for many who are far off. As many as our Lord God will call. Who's that include? me. That includes you. This is something that we have. It's not bad news. This is the good news here. Now, what's it mean to be without Christ? Um, you are at that time separated from Christ and alienated from the commonwealth and strangers of the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. Verse 12. Uh, alienated from the commonwealth of Christ Citizenship's important. People talk about citizenship. Citizenship is a big deal. It's got rights and responsibilities. It's got privileges. You remember the Apostle Paul, he was a Roman citizen. That's no mean thing. He wound up in Philippi and there was a big thing and they threw him in jail and they beat him. And uh, what happened? The jailer got converted because of the presence of God, washed him up, cared for him, 
he believed, his whole family, part of the Church of Jesus now. And then the people from the uh, town came and said, well, you can tell him he can go. I mean, we should never leave. We had no reason to hold him. And Paul says, not so fast. I'm a Roman citizen. What you did is a big, big no-no. And they said, oh, no. We have just done this to a Roman citizen. We can get in big trouble. So they came to him, and they said, please, please, we're very sorry. We shouldn't have done this. You, know, we, you, you please go with our, our blessing. And he said, okay, but, but remember, remember, having citizenship, there is a good thing. It's being part of Rome. Now, Roman citizenship is a big thing, but being part of the people of God is even bigger than this because you are heir to the, not just the power of Rome. By the way, there's still some Roman roads around. There's still some Roman ruins, even an aqueduct or two, maybe a bridge or two, I don't know, but there's not much of Rome left. Oh, it's, no. Heritage, yes. Legal stuff, yes. But uh, n nobody's fearing Caesar anymore. You know why? He's long dead. The promises of God are now because the kingdom of God is now. We are part of this now. This is why this is such a big thing, to be part of the people of God. Now, you heard the Old Testament reading in Isaiah. Was that saying, well, we don't let none of the foreigners come in here? No. Those who come, they're welcome. Those who become part are welcome. And the Bible's got lots of, of examples of that. I want to point to two. One of them is Ruth. She was from Moab, and she had no interest, no, no right to claim the promises of the people of Israel. And you know how the, her, her story goes. She marries a boy who is from Israel, and the dad dies, the boy dies, they all die. It's left with poor Naomi and these two widowed daughter-in-laws. And she said, look, I got nothing for you. Go back home. Maybe they've got something for you. And and uh, Orpah said, okay, and they cried. And Ruth said, no, no, I'm staying with you. And you look at the book of Ruth, and you realize it's not just because Ruth was so enamored of her mother-in-law, although she was, but she said, where you die, I'll die and be buried. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Why did she go? She went because she wanted to be part of God's people. What did she get? Well, she got a husband. His name's Boaz. You know this. She got a son, and from her line comes the great King David. From that line comes the Lord Jesus Christ. None of that would have happened as long as she stayed outside the people of God. Another example that I love is this uh, Syrian general, Naaman. He was a great general, but he had leprosy. And if you're afraid of, of uh, COVID or you're afraid of AIDS, people with leprosy, they, you couldn't go around with people because they were terrified of this disease. And if you're a great leader or general, you kind of need to be around people. It was probably a difficult thing. And he heard through the servant girl about this prophet in Israel where he could be healed. And he goes, and again, I hope you know this understanding of the narrative of the scripture where he goes and he does receive his healing. And he says, I want to worship the Lord. Give me, can I have, some, can I have a, lo, a, a wagon load of dirt so I can just even take the dirt with me? Put that there and remind me that I, I worship the Lord and worship the Lord only. He had no right to have anything, but he was brought in. Just because you have no right in a technical sense doesn't bar you. And when you hear the gospel, you know that there is nothing to bar you from coming to Christ. What else? We were foreigners to the covenant of promise, strangers of the covenant of promise. That's the real blessing of being part of God's people. We have the promises of God. Those promises are for you. All of those are for you. The promises talked about Jesus, where he would be born, that he'd go to Egypt, where he'd spend his childhood all the way down to him dying for us, suffering for us, and rising again. And that he's coming again. He's Lord of Lords and King of Kings. You know those promises, though, don't you? I mean, we, we gather and 
Christmas and we hear all these promises and we gather at Easter and we, we read and we also read about the promises and all this being foretold, you've been brought close. You've already been brought close. I don't want to get ahead of myself because what Paul's saying is very true, but you've been brought close. Pay them attention. The problem with the people of Israel who had all these is they didn't pay any mind. Now listen, there are those in the church of Jesus who hear the promises and aren't taking it any mind. We need to be standing on the promises, not just merely sitting on the premises. Vance Havner, old, old preacher, I love that one. We need to take it into our hearts. Take this into you that this is for you. Next descriptor, having no hope. Boy, that's really bad. I mean, being dead is bad enough, but no hope of anything else is really bad. But this changes because we have the hope in Christ. Those afar off have now been called. Think about that. The message of the gospel goes out through the whole world. And it doesn't matter what your biology is. You're connected to Abraham. No, you're connected to Abraham through faith. Every tongue, every tribe, every place. Lastly, our situation was said to be without God in the world. Sinful creatures, we need to know God. And if we're without God, we're in big trouble. The, the trouble with sin is we think it's okay to be without God. And some people say, I don't want God to mess up my life. But you've already messed it up. In the Lord is the salvation. Verse 12, remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers of the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's the bad news. Verse 13, again, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. All of that difficult language, that bad news is instantly gone because of what Christ has done. Instantly what done because Christ has done. You were spiritually dead and now as you're connected in Christ you're spiritually alive. You were sinful and now in Christ you are righteous and now then you were alone. Now you are part of God's people. You trust in Christ. Now how does this happen? You're trusting in Christ. You're in Christ. Your faith joins you to the Savior who saves. And because you're joined to Christ, you're joined to the people of God. And that's really important. You know, all of the Bible is for you. This is God's word. We sang from the first psalm about blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in God's word. And he meditates in it day and night. And what's he like? He is, God makes him, if anybody needs this, her too, him and her. That's the way the English language works here. Like a tree planted by the river. When it gets really dry, that tree continues to flourish because there's water. And I know, there's places right now where the water is too high. But water is needed. This is what we have in Christ part of the people of God and part of the family of God. Think about that image of family. I know there's difficult things in difficult families and we all go through difficult things from time to time, do we not? But the family is the root of the society that God has made. You know, In the beginning, there's the man and the woman and they have the children. And this is the family of God. And the Christian family is to be the incubating place of faith. This is where covenant children first hear the promises of God, that they're for them. And they learn to speak them and to sing them. You're not an outsider. You're not a citizen. Ah, uh, you're family. This is what we have in Christ. Now, this is true of everyone who is trusting in Jesus. I trust that you're trusting in Jesus. You need to trust in Jesus. There are people who put that off. That'd be a good thing. Yeah, you're right. 
I'm going to do that someday. Guess what? It's today. In Hebrews it says today is the day of salvation because that's the only day we have. Today, as you hear God's word, harden not your hearts as others did in times past. It's time to trust Jesus. And if you think you're far from the people of God, you're not. If you think you're far from the gospel of grace, you're not. It's here. It's now. Christ has made it possible. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Paul said he was the chief one. We can say that too. And people who are connected to Christ have this blessing that is eternal. You know that that uh, history about Naaman, you know the main human character, one of the most, the most important human characters, one that's not even named, it's this little girl. She's called the little Hebrew servant girl. Why? Because she tells of the power of God with the simplicity of a child. If you were there, you'd have the healing. And Naaman has to receive it like a child. You remember that part of it too, don't you? The prophet doesn't even come down, but sends word. Tell him to jump in the river seven times. He's like, I thought he'd come down and wave his arm and do some, you know, sparkly stuff for me. He was really upset. I mean, that's how, you know, we expect things our way. And his servant said, oh, if he asked you to do a hard thing, wouldn't you have done it? Let's do this. All right. Got to be like a child. Got to do it God's way. And he came out healed. And he came out changed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and ask that you would make us like that little Hebrew girl to be able to give an answer for the reason for the hope that we have. That they would hear the gospel and be saved. We thank you, Lord, that you, in your great love, have not left us on the outside. There is no one left on the outside, but the gospel goes to all. Open our eyes to see fields white with harvest. Lord, we pray for workers in your vineyard. And we thank you that you have given us a place in that as well. Again, Lord, for any who would hear that are not trusting in Christ, I pray that even now your spirit would warm their heart, open their eyes, and fill them with the realization that this great love shown to us in Christ is for them. And Lord, that you would build us up ever confident in Christ and in Christ alone. Amen. Let's continue to...